presents to you on his talk. Dr. Harish Pillai is the CEO of Aster DM Healthcare in India. He is one of the most influential leaders in the Indian healthcare industry. As a member of the Joint Commission International Standards Advisory Panel, he exerts strategic influence in the global healthcare landscape. He enjoys working with young minds and is a visiting faculty at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. We had the privilege to hear from him. So first of all, sir, thank you so much, sir, for joining and agreeing to share your thoughts with us. It is really a great matter of pride for all of us. Thank you so much, sir, for joining. It's my pleasure. Uh, so, sir, moving to the topic of discussion, which we have chosen for today's session is how automation will affect the healthcare industry. So, sir, uh, the topic is in itself a question. So, sir, uh, I would like to know what do you think and how will it be? It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a very wide uh, canvas what you said. So, I mean, you'll have to go back in time uh, to understand uh, what we are today. Um, so, if you look at from our own cultural point of view, Ayurveda is one of the most ancient of uh, medical disciplines. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, we have this famous uh, Charaka Samiti, which is basically a treatise of uh, medicine. Uh, and it's a core of Indian civilization. Uh, then came the process of, uh, uh, you know, the Vedas. When we talk about the Vedas, uh, we have uh, the Atharva Veda from which Ayurveda itself uh, follows through. But uh, what is quite interesting is the pinnacle of surgical techniques, uh, which has been pioneered by Shushruta in, uh, you know, in, in uh, and that uh, many of it is relevant even today. And from India, it flew on to uh, the Arabs and uh, that's how, uh, I guess, it went to the Western world. So when you talk about uh, technology, innovation, sometimes we get confused that whether in the, in the field of healthcare, it's all to do with uh, machines and uh, machine-related aspects. Not really, because we are talking about uh, the complexities of biological systems. And the understanding of biological systems is a very profound philosophy on its own. But coming, uh, you know, if you zoom back in time and uh, look at uh, the advances um, which happened in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, warfare has uh, played a very key role in terms of uh, bringing uh, techniques for handling of mass events. Uh, even for that matter, because we are in the midst of a pandemic, uh, global health crisis, whether it's large-scale uh, pandemics, whether it's when you talk about bubonic uh, plague, all these things have asked, uh, um, forced philosophers and thinkers to ask the right type of questions to find out the root cause of why does disease happen? Is it something to do with, uh, is it to do with biology or is it something beyond biology? Where those profound uh, philosophical questions being asked at that point of time. But that kind of structured questioning right from the Middle Ages uh, helped us to arrive at, for example, this famous germ theory of disease, which uh, came about. And then slowly we, we looked at the causative factors, you know, when uh, te uh, techniques and technology uh, improved such a, like discovery of the microscope uh, and invention of the microscope, it's not really a discovery and uh, looking at organisms at the microbial level. So it brought a, a totally new world uh, to humanity and we began to understand the, uh, uh, the causative effect uh, much more better. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the impact of uh, like conflict, I told you, one is acceleration of discovery because of collective sufferings, whether it's an epidemic, pandemic, and of course, uh, global war. A uh, lot of things have happened. Uh, in, in, when you come to uh, the 20th century, uh, I guess penicillin, uh, if you look at uh, some of these landmark events, right, uh, as a as a wonder uh, antibiotic, which was like a booster dose for a lot of things. Uh, even in our own country, like millions used to die because of malarial. Uh, we have these uh, roaring monsoons and post monsoons, a lot of people used to die because of uh, malaria. And the discovery of the malaria parasite and the vector in, involved, the Anopheles mosquito, these are all path-breaking findings in terms of uh, qualitatively 
improving the life of uh, man um uh, going forward uh, right now it's a it's a battle between uh, increased urbanization i think somehow uh, we are very we are a very selfish species in the sense that uh, we sometimes forget that uh, this is the only one blue planet what we have it's very fragile is extremely sensitive but uh, we for our short term uh, materialistic needs for one lifetime we are condemning future generations towards uh, extreme risk of uh, even survival for that matter uh, one uh, key root of acceleration of uh, such kind of pandemic this the theory that perhaps global warming has got a factor towards it uh, you know there is uh, there has been historical records of uh, uh, the accelerated pace of uh, heating up of the planet uh, which obviously uh, has got its own consequences because the climatic patterns are dramatically changed a uh, warming of the arctic and the antarctic regions has got its own uh, rise of sea levels so all those things uh, will impact our own ecosystem uh, the other biggest worry is that because of uh, uh, density of population and rise of population in general uh, we are now uh, pushing uh, towards uh, uh, non urbanized areas we are now going into forest forested land so the encounters between wild anim animals and humanity is also increasing rapidly so that is one of the reasons why we are getting more and more exposed to zo zoonotic viruses uh, what we known popularly as covid 19 is just one of hundreds i suppose which are yet to be discovered uh, we are just fortunate that covid 19 is not its case fatality ratio is nothing compared to the nipah virus or the ebola virus but Uh, it's a wake up call that it's just not sustainable the way we are working right now is just is not going to make things any better uh, per se coming down directly to your question that humanity has an advantage that the kind of responses if you look at response to this pandemic it's mostly technology driven uh, most people do not realize that the power of artificial intelligence and computing deep machine learning which is available as um, uh, given us a rare historical moment to predict pandemics much in advance uh, this is not a black black swan event when you talk about black swan event is something totally unpredictable which has got a catastrophic impact on the economy uh, which you know in some case could be reversible this is nothing like that because uh, if you search literature uh, almost 3 to 4 years back uh, there has been uh, quite vivid and open predictions that uh, a pandemic that also by a corona virus uh, would be there i mean if you look at the famous uh, ted talk by bill gates uh, he has you know gone on the public forum to say that it's it's just matter of time and see how true it has happened if you look at the hollywood block plus uh, blockbuster contagion uh, which is now uh, one of the top uh, view uh, one of the top trenders in uh, netflix Uh, it shows that you know even uh, screenplay writers were talking about this pandemic so much in advance so why should it be a surprise to us but the best part was this time when it happened uh, specifically two uh, ai firms one is called blue dot it's a toronto based firm they actually predicted this uh, they announced you know in a way uh, on december 31st which was 9 days before the chinese authorities or the world health organization talk anything about such an event taking place in wuhan uh, and how did these guys do it was uh, they were just analyzing micro climatic conditions uh, stratification of demographics disease trends and it just could pick it up that there is something happening out there and they they put up an alert similarly uh, there was another firm called metabiota now this is quite interesting metabiota had used natural language um, uh, programming algorithms and they were uh, completely into social media feeds uh, to look at what's really happening what is a hot topic being discussed and they also predicted uh, in fact they picked up this specific uh, covid-19 outbreak in wuhan and also talked about its spread to neighboring countries such as japan thailand uh, korea singapore much before even a single case happened in those countries so just see what kind of uh, so we are actually in that way from a technology point of view Uh, i would say far better prepared than uh, before uh, uh, the chinese authorities thankfully had released uh, the dna architecture uh, in a public domain and a lot of people used it so there was uh, one group of um, one company called 
in silica medicine which analyzed the dna architecture and looked at the existing vast database of drugs available around the world to look at which drug is most suitable for treatment of uh, this specific in terms of symptomatology it was a big boost for healthcare workers around the world which were struggling because as you know uh, the hot spot shifted from china to uh, united states it went to italy it went to spain and uh, hospitals were completely overwhelmed and doctors were uh, were really struggling because of the sheer volume of cases but because of these technological advances at least they could know through open source uh, discussions that these x amount of drugs are really perhaps more suitable for managing the symptoms of this uh, specific virus uh, some of the thoughts was uh, quite early in the day couple of months back uh, there were uh, teams around the world which which uh, looked at the same architecture and uh, started working on a candidate vaccine uh, though we are not able to tell exactly when will uh, when will a vaccine be available for worldwide use but uh, again ai programs uh, big data uh, cloud computing and uh, state of the art manufacturing facilities enabled us to fast track and i have no doubt that uh if you look at history of vaccines the present covid-19 vaccine whichever that vaccine would be it would be creating a new speed record uh, from thinking of a vaccine to production and finally uh you know going for a worldwide mass immunization program so all this is because of the tools uh, technological marvels what we have in, at, at our hand um coming back to india some of the things which we found was in in the early days much before uh, the famous uh, uh, address by prime minister modi to announce the first uh, you know the janta lockdown uh, there was a lot of panic among the common citizens about what is this virus all about most of the telephone lines in hospitals across the country got jammed up or people started calling up doctors to what e virus ke bare mein kuch bataiye ye kya hai you know all kinds of questions and uh, most of the telephone exchanges actually shut down because just couldn't handle the traffic that's when uh, hosp collaborated with uh, tech partners and brought about ai based chat boxes uh, you know chatbots which answer uh, frequently asked questions a lot of symptom trackers ai based symptom trackers were also there uh, which enabled someone who was basically has got a common cold or a flu how do you differentiate whether this is actually covid-19 or otherwise so these kind of innovation putting ai based chatbots out there and symptom trackers really help down to calm nerves in a very very big way and this is a real example here once from a from a public health point of view uh, uh, for example the lockdown right on uh, there are many examples of effectiveness of lockdown uh, you can go back to wuhan because uh, wuhan lockdown has been talked about in december in january where it was quite draconian in nature the chinese uh, because their political system is very different from a liberal democracy they could i suppose do many of the things which may not be possible in the past world so some of the things which they used was to convert dumb cctv cameras into intelligent ones by embedding face recognition algorithms inside that to understand Uh, based on uh, you know so your reports your residential address your national id whether you are breaking the quarantine rules for example uh, they also used intelligent drones uh, to have access to those public areas where uh, healthcare workers could not go for sanitization purpose you used drones to uh, you know spray those disinfectants over a large public areas some of these uh, drones also had infrared sensors to pick up skin surface temperature to on a population base so on an area level you could you could make out fever uh, you know fever pockets so uh, in india for example some of our state police forces whether it's in southern states such as karnataka kerala they also use uh, drones in terms of alerting uh, the public and also making public address uh, uh, public interest announcements to uh, to alert the population not to break the uh, lockdown norms uh um, some other aspects because the pandemic in a large country like ours we, we are literally a subcontinent you cannot use the kind of human resources to really deploy to to track to trace to track to isolate so that to uh, to overcome this human resource challenges uh, on the same of april government of india introduced the arogya sethu the mobile based app 
and it's a very good example of a, a public health response uh, where technology came in and app developers came in to create this kind of an architecture there has been uh, i suppose legitimate debates regarding privacy but from a public health point of view that overrides concerns about um, privacy in a way and it's uh, it's connected to a central server and data which is fed in gives access to public health uh, officials of of the district or the uh, the the ward in which the resident is staying about any covid case and the neighborhood is also alerted so this is a good example of an innovation from india itself uh, some of the examples uh, in terms of technology uh, from a public health perspective i would talk about is this is san francisco based company called fitbit uh, which used uh, sensors to pick up uh, basal heart rhythm sleep pattern disturbance and you can put that over a large geographical area and you can see that if there's an abnormal uh, sleep distance or if the heart rate is much more obviously the pop that the patient must be febrile and then you can uh, you know you can actively go and investigate and intervene intervene and find out why this is happening another example is uh, a smart thermometer called kinsa which with the help of a bluetooth is connected to your smartphone and it can pick up it can pick up real time temperature reading and send it to your mobile phone and from the mobile phone to a central network and you can imagine like your weather forecast what you see right across uh, a large geography you can see fever patterns you know which areas there is uh, people with more fever some which is less fever imagine that kind of data available for public health authorities you can intervene more faster so these are all uh, examples in the right way uh where innovation is really helping us to meet this pandemic i think the big difference uh, uh, based on uh, the policy some sometimes necessity is the mother of invention uh the central government of india the government of india has uh, introduced lot of changes like one landmark thing was uh, to create this new agency to increase collaboration with the indian space research organization that uh plan whether it's interplanetary missions or otherwise you can also have private sector collaborating in it and this is definitely going to create huge employment opportunity we have a amazing institution for space sciences in trivandrum where uh, the worry was the first few batches they were all attracted uh, to other countries because there were no job opportunities in india so at least that kind of talent we can reach in within our country so when you look at the the big picture at a macro level you have this incredible institutions where r&d uh, infrastructure is fantastic both from a hardware point of view and from a human resources point of view uh, i can give a couple of examples csi csir laboratories the indian institute of technologies uh, whether uh, the space research organization defense research development organization the iits um, the all india institute of medical sciences so all these agencies together along with a vibrant startup ecosystem just put them together you know uh, you need to have a governance structure but if you create that kind of a startup ecosystem i think india uh, can really leverage this new capital to become a technological power powerhouse uh, in service of humanity i hope this answers your question absolutely sir uh, so you have uh, told us many things and also i think it will be many uh, much fruitful to our viewers uh, so sir my next question to you although i say my or uh, it is generally a common question whenever we talk about uh, automation or whenever we talk about that uh, we are moving towards more iot machine learning or uh, ml so the most common question which come into existence is that uh, will it affect the jobs of people so sir what do you think for it so this is like that uh, old debate i mean i remember a uh, long time back when i was in college days uh, trade unions you know doing ink clubs in the bath uh, on the streets against computerization of banks and uh, look at where how we have come i mean these are basically misinformed debates happening i suppose the fear is natural because there is an information asymmetry people are unable to predict what's going to happen but banking is an excellent example of where technology has actually augmented job creation and it has made the process much more efficient like many of us uh, we are now mostly on a mobile phone we have never ever gone to a bank in our lives i mean this is you know a typical mill- millennial would never would have seen a bank branch uh, so it's a very transformative process because the entire back end and front end is uh, tech enabled 
and uh, but from a customer point of view it's fantastic it's secure and uh, encrypted uh, data but you get your uh, banking part done answer to your question is um, there will be reskilling required some segments of the economy definitely i think some of the jobs would become redundant but at the same time it's going to create many more job opportunities so what what is required is to go back into our academia our our schools and colleges change our curriculum and produce uh, graduates and post graduates as per industry needs uh, sometimes uh, i i fear that uh, it's because of a colonial uh, legacy that the reformation in the educational sector both at the uh, secondary school level higher secondary school level and graduate uh, level is not what the economy needs uh, to give you an example uh, from central europe if you look at the largest economy in central europe is uh, germany uh, germany took many, for many decades they never had management institutions which produce mbas so germany was well known for its polytechnics where they were focusing on skilling uh, skilling their uh, you know their working class and that is why germany is such a manufacturing powerhouse if you look at i mean most people only think about uh, germany in terms of luxury vehicles whether it's mercedes benz bmws and others but people do not realize that some of the fine skill surgical instruments some of the best surgical instruments in the world are from cottage industries in germany because of the high skill level uh, their workmen have and for a large country like ours uh, somehow we seem to have missed out on the manufacturing bus and it's also to do with uh, even while the government can work on reforming policy uh, as indian citizens i think we also need to have a paradigm shift in terms of what should we how should we guide our children to which vocation so skilling is i think something very important which is going to come so answer to your question is net to net i don't think there will be job lo- uh, job losses it's basically technology is going to augment and expand human ability to perform us uh, so, all right sir so my next question to you sir uh, do you think that uh, will automation make healthcare more affordable uh, very much so like uh, uh, one uh, live case study from india is the national cancer grid uh it at at the pivot you have the data memorial center from mumbai it's a government funded uh, scheme which has multiple stakeholders uh, involved the example of uh, the national cancer grid is to demystify uh, the voodoo's behind cancer treatment again like i told you before the keyword is information asymmetry so in the world of information asymmetry the the doctor at the pivot based on credentials expertise experience prominence uh will some more sit on the pedestal and this this happens because in a in a large country like like ours uh, people unfortunately travel quite a bit and you know in the example of the tata center it is considered like the mecca of oncology care uh, because of uh, the reasons i mentioned above you need not do that big because anywhere in the world you know sometimes it is it is now very rare but in the earlier days you find a lot of these vi so called vips were mostly politicians or celebrities traveling abroad for uh, expert medical care and used to keep wondering why 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 are they doing that because it's the same completely altered uh, so and it is significant reduce the cost of care it's my wish that what the national cancer grid has uh, done can also be applied in other uh, non communicable diseases whether pulmonary care technology uh, neurosciences orthopedics most of these uh, uh, clinical algorithms because now we have huge amount of data uh, we can actually standardize treatment protocols and reduce cost of care there's no doubt about it you can uh, hear me harsh uh, yes sir i can hear you uh, so sir my next question to you sir as for now uh, what i have listened i don't know what is the inner thing uh uh recently uh, the telemedicine concept is more emerging as far as uh, for now uh, because uh, it help people to stay at their home and take the advice from their doctors so sir do you think that uh, will it take uh, forward or uh, will it change uh, future consultancies will be totally based on the telemedicines uh, <laughs> so uh 
as long as there are human beings uh, it cannot be we have not you know that's that's the stuff of science fiction at this stage uh, that's uh, that's uh, being very utopian so telemedicine is here to stay i, I completely accept that and there are some disciplines where i guess more telemedicine consumers would be there but it cannot be for all uh, disciplines like uh, for example if you if you if you're sitting in your home and you want to have a consultation let's give you a simple example i have stomach pain so now stomach pain can be because of many reasons it can be uh, you know it could be a surgical problem it could be a medical problem it could be a psychosomatic issue it can also be a cardiac issue you never know but then uh, uh, the best case scenario is that when you speak to a so when you do a teleconsultation they can triage you basically it's a triaging purpose to say to rule out what could be and this is this is also uh, there are limitations on that so uh, you can't say that telemedicine is uh, is the gold standard for medical care i think that would be a big, big mistake and a big fallacy because it can result in wrong diagnosis see uh, please understand that even in the best of uh, algorithms like i talked about artificial intelligence program it is never 100% accurate uh, the strange part about human biology is that even in our anatomy textbooks they talk about variations in anatomic structure sometimes they do your profit to investigations and you operate on a bit and then you realize oh my god this guy has got an unusual anatomy which is a bit different uh, from what you normally are used to see so those variations are part of uh, nature mother nature uh, so answering your question is that uh, telemedicine will play a significant role but it is not going to replace uh, your traditional visit to your doctor or to a hospital that unfortunately at this time it cannot be uh, uh, all right sir uh, so sir as far as now we are seeing daily the condition is becoming more worse and worse hopefully it will get uh, better soon uh, so sir my next question to you as you have experienced so much and you are into this world from many long time uh, so sir what do you think how much we are prepared to fight this pandemic uh, it's it's very sad you know as a patriotic citizen of this country i feel very sad about the state of affairs in the sense that we have completely neglected public health you know as a as a country aspiring to be a global power we have not invested in social sectors and the uh, uh, suppose it's also to do going back to the constitution of india that we have a, we have a federal structure where uh, many subjects such as healthcare is in state as part of the concurrent list of the constitution of india it is part of the st- the state the state governments have a clear role in it so broadly speaking i can uh, see that southern india the states in southern india starting with kerala karnataka tamil nadu andhra and telangana they have invested much more in social sectors mainly in public health care and education compared to the the bigger states in india which is what we call traditionally the bimaru states right the large uh, states would uh, uh, acronym which is being used but unfortunately there is a big uh, uh, demand there's a big demand supply gap and this multi decade you know we are more than seven decades old our republic uh, it's it's clearly showing the lack of investment in human resources and infrastructure so i think the silver lining for us um, is that it's a wake up call for the citizens of india to demand of their politicians that every political party need to have in their manifesto that they must promise significant investment in uh, public health systems uh, we need to upscale quite a bit of uh, about it. our human resources capacity is suboptimal there is more skewing towards urban centers more towards south india uh, i think uh, to overcome this demand supply gap the reformations which are due has already happened in terms of transformation of the medical council of india to the national medical uh, commission i think that's uh, that uh, the, that's the uh, um, Uh, step in the right direction these kind of reformations uh, will have uh, an impact in terms of doubling uh, our current uh, volume of human resources whether it's graduate doctors post graduate doctors we also the other earlier example which i talked about skilling of human resources so we have the national skill uh, council uh, which is there in uh, delhi uh, so there's a healthcare skill council also which is doing quite a bit of pioneering work into increasing the amount of skilled workers available like you know as we speak because of covid 
a lot of new verticals have come up like home care for example like you you mentioned about teleconsultation home care is a big subject so suddenly you find that there is a big shortage of phlebotomists a nursing assistants a physiotherapist uh, so all these kind of these are all skilled uh, skilled uh, skill workers are needed so i think uh, these policy changes will really help us uh, to shape up in a big way uh, but there are hard lessons also to be learned that uh, from a policy point of view uh, i suppose it's time like the uh, the central services right the when we talk about the administrative the the so called steel backbone of india whether the ias and others i always wondered that why is the principal secretary help is always an ias officer and why is why is this is not a specialized cadre so if you give you if i give you the example of uh, another country france in france large public hospitals are managed by very young professionals who pass out of the french public uh, you know the public school so they are professional managers trained to run public hospitals giant public hospitals of 1000 bed plus in india typically you find that the senior most doctor in the cadre uh, they are basically clinicians they are asked to become the medical superintendent or the medical director and asked to take over management responsibilities uh, people don't uh, the, the system needs to understand that management is a science uh, for which you need to have a professional cadre who can manage the enterprise with limited resources so i think that is something uh, which we need to do in a very big way we need to focus on uh, preventive sectors uh, especially we have got good programs uh, the fact that we have eliminated polio in a large country like us say that if there's a there's a political will the system really works the silver point i mean these are the negatives which i told you i think the positives is that uh we have ayushman bharat the world's largest uh, insurance scheme which covers almost 500 million citizens it is a much needed safety net uh, for a large amount of a population who unfortunately would slip into acute poverty due to single episodic exposure to private healthcare so i think ayushman bharat you can it's 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 a, it's a hot topic for debate people will turn, always uh, criticizing it's fine it's a work in work uh, work in progress model can be fine you think the intent is right Uh, we need to ensure that the required budgetary allocations are made uh, so that i think that's very important i also like this other effort government of india to make country the whole country home defecation free that we are investing in building toilets uh, as part of swachh bharat which i think is is fantastic uh, the the present administration's resolve to give portable water to all citizens which which i think is extremely important uh the di- distribution distribution of lpg uh, cylinders the oil scheme i think that's phenomenal uh, it uh, really eliminates this whole issue of uh, respiratory diseases to a large population in the rural sector so if you look at from a holistic point of view all these things actually improve the health health of the citizens uh, but the the thing is the economy needs to kick start and we must make make it a, a strategic resolve that health sector especially public health should be a uh, a strategic sector for the government of india you need to uh, put in a, up to 5 to 6% of gdp towards uh, a health sector uh, continuously for a couple of decades otherwise uh, you know when we talk about india becoming a superpower that will be a pipe dream we need to invest in education and health sector Uh, all right sir so i don't want to waste your much time so moving to my uh, next question or rather uh, i would say sir uh, what will be your advice to our viewers uh, in this corona time it's just very simple you got to be sensible uh, stay uh, safe and secure uh, please follow the instructions given by various uh, public health authorities your district administration um uh, others and it's it's all basics right the, when i talk about self discipline you need to wear a mask uh, a mask should not be uh, mostly when i see pictures people wear mask uh, as if it is some some sort of a decoration they don't cover their nose they don't cover their mouth it's somewhere on the chin which is it's absurd you need to know that the <laughs> uh, this is meant to be a mechanical first line of defense to prevent the virus from entering your respiratory system so you need to wear the mask appropriately you need to know how to wear a mask and how to remove a mask it's a it's a very simple technique you need to maintain hand hygiene extremely important to maintain hand hygiene 
it's a cultural tendency for us to keep touching our different parts of our face we need to avoid that social distancing is is so important you need to practice that diligently and if you do these uh, simple things follow your public health uh, administration's advice uh, things ought to be better you need to also look after your mental health in the sense that uh, lockdown sometimes can be uh, very depressing and uh, so how do you engage yourself mentally uh, we have a lot of these uh, cultural traditions of getting up early in the morning for example do your pranayama do a bit of meditation it really helps you uh, to be fresh early morning maintain your diet well hydrate yourself i think those kind of simple measures uh, will really help you quite and i suppose one important advice to the youngsters is that try and avoid your mobile phones and i know it's a, it's tough advice uh, but mobile phone addiction is also a disease uh, and there's a whole lit- whole things of literature coming about mental health issue people who are completely addicted to social media and mobile phones so if you can detox yourself from your mobile phone social media apps this 24 by 7 television networks is very damaging for your health if you stay away from these things i, I suppose we should all be fine uh thank you so much sir for these advices and also it was a nice interaction with you thank you so much sir for joining and we look forward to conduct more and more session with you thank you so much sir thank you pleasure thank you, sir.